Well, I have to give a little bit of background here because if we're jumping into uh, the stage and show business, my, the my, my, my artistic training, I went to Cal Arts. I was actually the first actor accepted into the School of Theater at, at Cal Arts. And in my experience in my 20s, I had a tremendous, uh, almost exclusively classical theater, but I, I had a tremendous experience in classical theater in my 20s, which gave me a certain perspective of being able to see a whole show as a whole and not, not just being you know, one element of it. Actually, the Selton John costume, what, 29 years later, has become a seminal costume in his career because of the imagery and the place and the way that that imagery read, unbeknownst to me how good a quality that was going to be. So I'm just I'm saying about my, my theatrical background, if I place myself, like if I was going to be playing that role of rock star, what would be the appropriate thing to wear? So that's, that's where I started from. And being that you know, Elton John, the piano man, there were seven outfits that I did for him for this tour. And the, the phone call came in one day at like 4.30 in the afternoon. That night I did 27 drawings. By 9 o'clock the next morning, the messenger picked up those drawings, took them to Elton. And within a 24-hour period, the phone call, the execution of the drawings, and the picking of seven of those drawings, that was done. And I, I, I decided to, to apply the design onto the fabric using embroidery thread. Because all I was thinking about was they wanted me to paint, they wanted my art on the fabric. But how do you do that where it's gonna come across like in a 50,000 seat venue, at least? Central Park turned out to be 400,000 people. So I found this embroidery company and I did them and they were literally being shipped. This one outfit, this piano outfit, got there the night before Central Park. And at that time I didn't even know about the Central Park concert until the next week I, I got my Time Magazine in the mail and there was him in that outfit at Times Square. But what happened was that embroidery thread, which I thought would be opaque because it's, I, thought just, I just thought because it's on the surface, it's, it's not in the fabric, so it wouldn't, I just thought it wouldn't fade because it was on the surface, it was solid. But what I didn't get, how, how spectacular it was gonna reproduce on camera, because it, at the end of everything's about the camera, is that embroidery thread is, is made with, with a satin thread. So when you get large areas covering, uh, you have large areas of solid um, uh, embroidery, it acts as a reflector for the camera. It doesn't absorb light any, at all, so it just reflects it right back to, to, to the camera. So when you took a picture, you could take a shot of this costume of Elton John with 400,000 people in Central Park with the piano outfit on the piano man, and you could take a shot from across a football field, field with, and there's no fading whatsoever. It, it's as sharp as a tack. So that, that was a deciding factor, and that's what, that's what helped to create that. It's such an iconic thing, was the preservation on camera. And it just took, it took the most fantastic picture. Well, I'll just to give you a little sidebar again about you know, dealing with show business. My, I, my, my, my experience has always been when opportunity knocks, being prepared, that's the whole secret, because you never know when those opportunities, especially it seems to me in show business, knock. And so it's always the ones that get the gold ring are the ones that can produce on a dime. And that's always been my, that's my experience that's still, that's still with me. This was like 1982, and I had just met her through a, a mutual friend, and she'd bought a couple of my paintings. I don't know, it must have been about six weeks later, two months later maybe, I got a call from her office asking if I could make a presentation of a, for an album cover. Her visual representation of the Bette Midler thing is still a very big part of her persona. I did an image of her uh, based, on a, based on a title they gave me for this, uh, for this album cover, which was something about great big jugs, and, and it was changed later to uh, no frills. And she was known for her big breasts, so I had, I had the breasts and, and doing kind of a Picasso-y, Hirschfeld-y kind of a caricature-ish, a Mirapolsky caricature of herself. And uh, so the big breasts and then these legs that kind of made a half a moon. And in, the, and in the middle of the legs, I had like a doorway, which was the crotch area. I made like, like a, a, a doorway. Because when I made this presentation with her, and I also have to say that honestly, I, I, I think that I was like the last one that they called. 
that this was one of those things where they had been honest because she was already, she was already booked into concerts. Everybody's, the, the record was, 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 was uh, finished, but they didn't have the visual look yet. They didn't know what their visual direction was, what the look was going to be. So I think they'd already been through everybody. And somehow maybe she just remembered, she got these paintings, well, try him. When I brought this presentation in to the record, she was the recording studio, a small room, a bunch of people. And also I have to say that, that Bette Midler, uh, in my life experience, Bette Midler I think was one of the smartest people I've ever come across. So my idea of doing this, of doing this abstract representation of, of Bette Midler in a few uh, you know, um, um, lines was to take that and you could change the backgrounds and have it the same but have it being different on, in many different kinds of venues. The breasts also had nipples on them. But what really got her when I was showing the artwork um, was when I started to explain to her that, she could, that this could be blown up on stage 20 feet tall and she could make her entrance to the crotch. Well, and as she's walking down the stairs, like they could light up one stair at a time as she's walking. Well, you know, I thought Bette Midler, I mean, that's her whole thing was being, you know, she's divine Miss M, she's body, she's, you know, I mean, she's got a lot of blue humor in her act, you know. Um, she freaked out. She freaked out. And I have to say that, that uh, that's not something that I would, that I would recommend anybody to, to experience in one's life, to be in a small room with Bette Midler freaking out. Because even though she's very small in stature, she's just gigantic in, in her sensibility. And I thought that was it. I thought, I, I thought she, you know, she's going, oh, what are you doing to me? I'm with a crotch. I'm, what do you think? I'm, what you, you know, I'm walking in through a crotch. And, <laughs> and when, she settled, when she settled down, because the, the art piece was right on, the caricature was, was right on. She said, okay, just f fill in the crotch and take out the nipples. And that was it. And from that moment, and then from then on, it, everything was carte blanche, and it, it, it turned out to be extremely successful. Because from that album cover, then the album cover, it turned out that it was on all the merchandising, it was the stage set, it became the entire look, and her face was on nothing. She was represented completely by my caricature. Which is, a, which is a very unusual, uh, rare uh, time where an artist will allow themselves to be represented almost exclusively by artwork and not a photograph of themselves. So in 1983, I went to New York as my first pilgrimage to New York as a professional adult. I'd been there before as a kid, coming in and out of New York Harbor on homelies, but I hadn't been there yet as a professional. And by 1983, when I got there, um, I had Elton John there in Central Park with that costume, which absolutely saturated that city. I mean, that was like 100% saturation of that city. And then Bette Midler was at Radio City Music Hall. Between Elton and Bette, they had saturated that city. I mean, just re absolutely saturated that city with those imagery. That's where everybody knew those images. Everybody, the waiters, the, everybody knew those images there. And uh, so when I, in going to New York in 83, you know, I had all these, uh, I was nervous, uptight, you know, the, the, about the big New York thing and being, you know, aggressive and hostile and, you know, how was I going to fare? When I got there, everybody was fantastic. You know, everybody was fabulous. So it was a fantastic trip. So I came back and, and I did, a, I did a, a, a big painting on paper and it was a cartoony painting with word bubbles and thought bubbles. And one of the, uh, and, uh, and the theme of the painting was me going to New York in a baby carriage and, um, and out of the baby carriage, I think it was out of the baby carriage, I was saying this word bubble, fear no art, that I had gone to New York and God damn it, they didn't put, they didn't knock me down. You know, I still, I still, I feared no art. So I had that up on my wall and this friend of mine was working at a poster button company at the time. And uh, he loved that saying and he said, uh, that should be a button. Put the artwork on that button together. I'll do a thousand buttons for free. So I just had the buttons made. And then seemingly in 84, right after that, in 84, I, I think once I was maybe in the fall of 84, through somebody else, this woman came over to my studio and she was a museum rep to the museum art stores. So she loved that Fear No Art button. And she's the one that got a place, I, at the height for about a 10-year period, I had about 300 museum stores around the country. And it was used, I was saying earlier too, it was used 
against the government. It was used as a pro, it became a protest slogan against the government, the, the non-funding of National Endowment of the Arts. To four years after that, then President Clinton used it in a major cultural policy speech. And, and it's shown up and it's, it keeps moving through the culture ever since, and it's into its third decade now, as, as a single slogan phrase image. And I got those buttons, and the day after I got those buttons, I went to France, and that was the first place I had to give out those buttons was, New, was, in, was in Paris, where I, again, where I was born. I was born in Paris, and I landed in Paris the night of my 33rd birthday, which double threes, I put all kinds of things, and I, ha and I had those buttons, and I was giving them out. And when I came back from Paris within 12 hours, I fell asleep at the wheel of my car from jet lag, and I plowed into a telephone pole. And I, I had a, a major, major car accident. So then Fear No Art became the cover for this book. The full title was Fear No Art, A Crash Course in Reality. The drawings were about uh, six weeks into the whole procedure because I had seven operations in nine months. And I made the correlation between the doctors and the artists all trying to do good because I, I had major uh, reconstructive plastic surgery. And I found it's just fascinating how these people do what they do. And I, I just couldn't get over that. So from a very early time, somehow in my mind, I knew that I was going to be okay. So I was able to relax and actually enjoy the whole, the whole thing in some crazy way. So by the time I could get into my wheelchair and, and start to document and illustrate, try to make some sense in a, in a linear story board kind of format of that particular story, I, I was ready to go. First, I thought about the format of these illustrations. And I, I thought of my body being ripped and torn apart, being put back together. So I thought that whatever the format of these illustrations should be, they should have some kind of that relationship. So I took a torn piece of cardboard and paper and string and staples and this kind of medium to illustrate my own, my own physical body being ripped apart, torn apart, put back. You know, Absolute Vodka, they came up originally, you know, with this uh, groundbreaking a fantastic groundbreaking breaking advertising concept of using you know, so-called fine art to represent a product, to brand and to represent a product. And that idea became, I think, one of the all-time successful advertising uh, concepts in advertising history. And the, the, whole, the whole program started with uh, Andy Warhol doing the first ad, and I think Keith Haring, I think, did maybe the second, third, or whatever. But it was a campaign that, 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 found, that found a niche, that found that, that Absolute was, had just come to the United States. They even changed the shape of the bottle for the American market. And their, their concept was around that bottle, was around the shape of the bottle. So they would give the artist the shape, the bottle, and they would have to somehow incorporate an art piece with that bottle. The underground title in the, in the ad was Absolute whoever, Absolute uh, Herring or Warhol. Mirapolsky. I was asked by somebody, they were putting together a, um, a presentation to Absolute of trying to get West Coast artists because up until that time in the 80s it was a lot of East Coast artists. So the pitch was made that they should use West Coast artists too. And they liked it, they liked the pitch, but they added on to it and the, the first ad became, and I still think it's the, still the biggest single ad in advertising history. It was called Absolute Artists of the 90s. And um, this was a booklet of 36 artists, a collection of 36 artists that was in a booklet that they, that they put into several different magazines, but as one booklet inserted into, into these magazines. And that was the first time, that was my first Absolute Art plug, was in that collection of Absolute Artists of the 90s. And then, that was like 91, I think. And then in 96, I got reconnected with them. And at that time, they were, they were just putting on, and I, and I do believe at that time, it was the longest continuous broadcast on the World Wide Web. They rented a studio in Venice. They got an artist to come down to the studio to work, and it was all shot on camera live and beamed on the internet. So that as the artists were working on their artwork, people could type in and ask questions of the artist. It was a fabulous idea. It was called the Human Ant Farm and as part of their website. 
and it was basically like one camera mounted on a ceiling wall. And as it, as it went on, actually, with the different artists, with, depending on how technology orientated the artists were, they started bringing in their own cameras and covering up that camera and doing this and that. So it started to become more and more sophisticated. But even, even in an unsophisticated way, it was still, you know, retrospectively now, it was still a first. And then from now 96 to 97, Absolute had a billboard location on Sunset at, and Crescent Heights in Los Angeles. But nothing had happened about that location. But I did get a call asking me if I'd be interested in doing a billboard in the San Francisco location. Of course I said yes. And little did I know, that billboard in, in, in San Francisco was the landmark billboard of San Francisco. As it turns out, I, I went to New York in 2005 to do a, a, sp a little speech about, uh, as a layperson in outdoor for out outdoor advertising because of that billboard, what I thought about you know, outdoor advertising and the biggest and how to make it, you know, how to make it impactful. And I found out at that convention um, that that location of that particular billboard, that my absolute billboard, which was up from 97 to 99, that location in the billboard industry was in the top five billboard locations in the whole country. My approach to this, this billboard in San Francisco, um, I, I, I wanted to pay homage to the Summer of Love. It went up in 97, and the Summer of Love was 67. So I, I did it all in a, kind of a nouveau-ish lettering style. The bottle was lying horizontally, and the, the word absolute done in the nouveau style of lettering. And then in, in, like in the O, which is right in the middle of the word, I made the negative in the O like a P symbol. Ideally, they should have lit it with black light. And now I think the technology for doing that is a lot easier than, than maybe then. But they still printed it in day glow colors. So it, it definitely, that was the whole idea was that it, that it was psychedelic and that I was paying homage to the summer of love. My experience with The Tonight Show, which was over a seven year period, where my artwork appeared on a, about 200 shows. In television production, a simple idea that turned out to be like a radical idea. And first I have to preface this by saying that a production like The Tonight Show tends to be extremely hermetic. This is a machine. A show like this that's been on the air for so long is a machine. And everybody associated with it, they all are working and collaborating so tightly together over such a long time that it, it, it just goes. So for an outsider to come in, not even, not even a union or anything, but really an outsider to get into that mix, it's a very, very unique and unusual th uh, occurrence. But somehow I did, you have, getting a relationship with this art director and then one day hearing that they needed some more backdrops. And when I heard that, I said, well, why don't, you know, I'll, I, I can paint some backdrops. And when Jay Leno took over the show from Johnny Carson, fewer comedians were going on the show. And at the end, when they had their entertainment segment of the show, it was like 80% bands, I think. So they commissioned me to, to do this artwork. This is an interesting story in that the way the art director pitched this to the producers was that if this artwork, which was done to scale, was done by one person and, and was all coming from one hand, as opposed to the scenic shop, they had one guy who painted to scale. On television, it came off 5 to 10% more impactful on camera. And they also paid me the same money they paid the scenic shop, which is an important part of this as well. Why not try it? Which is still no guarantee because, like I said, the, the, the philosophy in a show like a Tonight Show is if it's not broken, you don't fix it. You just continue the machine. So, but they did. And this turned out to be a production breakthrough because, as it turns out, in all the television production, the concept of getting an artist to do original artwork for a set hadn't been done. It hadn't been done like this. It's extremely graphic. And it played on all kinds of music, from R&B to, you know, to heavy metal, to everything. And also played with Elton John. 17 years after Central Park, my stuff was with Elton again on The Tonight Show.